Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Archive. This is episode 13, and I am your host, Holden. This episode will be a bit different today, as it won't feature a news-to-me segment, the typical what I've been playing for the week portion of the show, but instead it will just feature miscellaneous topics. And then after that portion of miscellaneous talk, there will be a Wii review, and that's how the show will go. And I pray the Lord may add his blessings to this episode. So, for this newer segment I'm doing, it's called The Thing About Things, where I just decide to talk about really anything rather than talking about a game. And the thing I'm going to discuss in The Thing About Things is Red Steel 2. Now, in my last episode, I had changed Red Steel 2's score from a 8 to a 7.5, and I had placed it underneath No More Heroes. I am reverting that decision and giving it back its original 8 score, but it is staying beneath No More Heroes. Now, one might think it's a bit silly for a game that has a lower score to sit above a game that has a higher score, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. The scores that I give these games are, as I said in the first episode, which I believe I've been told is a rough listen, so I'll reiterate it here. The scores are based on two things. The first being how good the idea is, and the size of the idea, and how dynamic the idea is, and how fun the idea is, potentially. And then the second is execution of the idea. And there's some other things I could go into as well, but those are the main things I focus on. How much I enjoy a game almost has nothing to do with what kind of score they're going to get. Or, at the very least, I try to ensure that my subjective enjoyment doesn't tip the scales too much. Of course, how much fun I have with a game does indicate how well they execute their idea and and whatever, but I'm getting off topic. The reason I'm giving No More Heroes Ascendancy over... Red Steel 2 is because while No More Heroes doesn't execute its ideas and vision as well as Red Steel 2 does, ultimately I find the the dynamicism within No More Heroes to be more important than the superior execution of Red Steel 2. I think Red Steel 2... uh, as I said, executes its vision with far more success than No More Heroes because No More Heroes is a game with ups and downs and it does really good in its down moments, but in its up moments it kind of falters and if you chase a down moment with another down moment you can kind of get a frustrating and boring game and so that's why I say No More Heroes has a execution issue. But the scope and the different things at play in No More Heroes, in my opinion, are more interesting and more impressive the balance they strike, I guess. And the style conveyed in No More Heroes, the punk world, makes it more memorable than Red Steel 2, in my opinion, even though Red Steel 2, even though Red Steel 2 isn't lacking in style either. No More Heroes, it's, as a package, is more ambitious and more dynamic than Red Steel 2. So while it flounders in its execution, its scope, and 
vision are just more impressive than what Red Steel 2 is going for. And, of course, when I'm reviewing these games, I do take into account uh, scope and ambition. And those two things will often put a ceiling on what kind of score a game can get. Punch-Out being an excellent example of that. Punch-Out, it's a game that has no real issues at all. And it's a great game, that's why I give it an 8 out of 10. But it has such a tight focus, and it's not necessarily super deep. So it's not deep, and it's not broad in its ideas. So I, in my mind, I don't think I can say it's greater than an 8. And same with Red Steel 2. It's a game that goes for one thing, and that one thing is very important in the Wii game catalog, and that is the excellent motion controls, which the Wii could always do with a few more of those. Since it's not necessarily a concept that was fully realized throughout the Wii's lifestyle, but games like Red Steel 2 did bring that potential to its full realization. And so Red Steel 2, it is excellent at doing that, and it executes its vision far better than No More Heroes. Even so, No More Heroes has a grandeur that Red Steel 2 doesn't have. And that comes down to multiple things, whether they be design or happenstance, working together. For instance, No More Heroes combat system isn't as good as Red Steel 2's, but the boss fights in No More Heroes are better than that of Red Steel 2. And that comes down to, I think, just a lot more things working together throughout the entire game and within those particular boss fights. So all I really wanted to say was Red Steel 2 maintains its 8 out of 10, but it goes beneath no more heroes and just to reiterate the scores and the rankings while they come into contact with one another to an extent they are separate so there always is a possibility that a game with a lower score can have ascendancy over a game with a higher one just to reiterate that's really all i'll say about that i probably said too much anyway how as for other things I probably wanted to talk about, um, I was watching that Smash Direct, and they revealed that Min Min was the next DLC character, and I think that's the most obvious choice in the best way, as opposed to the worst way. Spring Man, for instance, would have been the most obvious and worst choice, I suppose, Sakurai tied his own hands because Spring Man is an assist trophy, but he could have reversed that. Yet, I'm glad he didn't because Min Min, when I played ARMS, was the best character in the game, and she had the most unique moveset, and really all I want to say is that was the right call to put Min Min in, despite what I've heard some people say. Obvious, but it's obvious because it's unilaterally the best option and I'm glad they went with it seeing that she'll be the next DLC character actually makes me want to buy a AC adapter for my switch and actually be able to play it again but I don't think I'm going to do that in Canada one of those power cords cost $40 and I just don't want to play my switch that much so I'm gonna wait a long time see what the other DLC characters are before I purchase anything related to Smash Ultimate, either piecemeal or wholesale, depending on what's revealed. Because you wouldn't want to purchase the entire Fighter Pass a year in advance to find that out that the last character is a Fire Emblem character that was only put in to advertise for a game and not because of fan demand but that's 
that's whatever. Yeah, that's my two cents about the new arms representation in Smash. I don't think they could have done it any better. As for other things, I suppose I could talk about that SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom review that was on GameSpot the other day. And if you want to know why I don't let my subjective feelings on a game dictate the score, that's precisely why. I think when the fella who did the review on GameSpot wrote that, he was reflecting his enjoyment level of the game and not actually the game's quality. And that's, I suppose, one way you can do it, but there's no way that a game that's that functional and nice looking and put together well gets a 2 out of 10 unless the reviewer is simply stating how little they enjoyed it which in my opinion that is irrelevant in a review it can help you put together your thoughts your feelings on the game but it's not the end game so that was kind of silly and more than likely amateur I haven't written reviews myself, but I've spoken them at the very least. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is Ocarina of Time. This doesn't fall under my news to me segment because I'm not going to talk about the game in its entirety. I just want to talk about Master Quest. And I've played Master Quest only once. This is my second time going through it. The first time I played Master Quest, I got as far as the Fire Temple. And I know exactly where I stopped. And this time I got past the Fire Temple, past that particular puzzle, and am just getting into the Gerudo Desert. All more than likely beat it this time i might as well just see it through only have two dungeons left i would say that master quest playing it the second time is largely a negative experience the game itself is still enjoyable and all the things that matter are still present therein for the most part and they have left those alone so there's no damage done there It's just that the dungeons in Master Quest aren't very good, in my opinion. For one thing, they take the three sprawling dungeons of the game, and that would be the Forest Temple, the Fire Temple, and the Water Temple, which are kind of done in the vein of Link's Awakening and also Oracle of Ages and Seasons, which weren't out, but they're of that likeness. And they streamline them down so that they're really linear and boring, but also still annoying to do. So they're not any easier for being streamlined. They're just less explorative. And so that's kind of disappointing. The worst thing about the Master Quest is that all the puzzles are kind of stupid and asinine. Asinine being the keyword they hide keys in lumps of dirt and you don't know they're there because the keys aren't in a treasure chest so the compass is useless to you so you have to look for a needle in a haystack blow up every lump of dirt that was the bottom of the well you have to hit random panels on the walls Navi will light up green and she'll indicate that to you, but aside from her, there's no reason to think that you would hit a panel to make a treasure chest appear, but that's what they want you to do. And it's just puzzles like that 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 make the dungeons feel kind of like a needle in a haystack kind of puzzle solving where it's just not intelligent at all. It's just kind of stupid and haphazard where you sort of just poke and prod everything kind of reminds me of breaking all the pots to reveal a pressure plate in link to the past except far more annoying 
and in a 3D environment. And in Link to the Past, that kind of random scour the room puzzle worked because the room was much smaller and usually the challenge was evading enemy fire while you did it. It wasn't finding the switch itself, but in Master Quest, the challenge is literally just uh, looking for obscure, out-of-the-way buttons that aren't placed in intuitive positions or clever places. They're just placed somewhere stupid. One example of this is I was trying to drain the well in the forest temple. And I knew that you did that in the original rendition of the dungeon, but I imagine the switch to do so was placed in a obvious spot. And when I didn't see any such obvious eye switch that you shoot with the bow, I looked within the well itself, thinking, oh, they must have hit it underneath the water line. You know, isn't that devious? And then I didn't find it. Turns out I was right to look there. It's just that I was looking from the wrong angle and was probably standing directly on top of the switch and so therefore couldn't look down to see it. I had to look from the other side of the well. And maybe that's just me where I didn't exhaust every possible option at my disposal, but I thought it was pretty cheap that I had the right idea, but... It was literally just a matter of poor sight lines that prolonged that uh, puzzle. And that that's how a lot of the puzzles in this game just are. You have the right idea, but they just put the thing you're looking for in a weird corner where you wouldn't look. Really, I think, like, the dungeon design in Master Quest is anti-design the things that developers know not to do. And they just kind of, uh, I suppose, using the knowledge that players had playing the original Ocarina, they could play off that in an interesting way, and maybe some people enjoyed that kind of zagging. But for me, when I hadn't played Ocarina in three years... I just found it kind of annoying and stupid, and and a lot of people, when Master Quest came out, they probably hadn't played Ocarina for three years as well, so it's kind of a similar experience, and so I imagine their feelings on its dungeon design were more than likely similar to mine. Of course, it's not all bad. The increase of enemies... Per a dungeon does give you more chances to perfect your swordsmanship in Ocarina, which Ocarina doesn't necessarily have excellent combat, but I suppose the increased combat difficulty and increased enemies will make the combat have a little more bite than it did before, and it will make items like the big Goron sword more meaningful as well. So at the very least... Master Quest does aid the experience in that manner, but overall the dungeon design of Master Quest is kind of terrible and sort of haphazard. In some cases, there are portions of the dungeons that are just left entirely redundant. One such example would be the Fire Temple where the big firewall maze where I think you originally get the hammer, is just entirely bypassed. All you have to do is take the hammer, which you've acquired earlier in the dungeon, and just hit the pillar in the center of the room, and then you can go right to the boss from there. That entire big open area is useless and will gain you nothing. And... While I'm on that subject, a lot of rooms in the other dungeons also will gain you nothing. Your compass will indicate a treasure chest. And once you uncover that treasure chest, there will just be five rupees in it. So that room was useless to you. And that's 
what a lot of these rooms are optional rupees that you can't use anyway because you haven't freed enough sculptulas or killed enough sculptulas rather and uh, that's also kind of flaccid and stupid i don't know it largely i would say that the master quest is not the definitive experience for ocarina of time and i wouldn't recommend playing it it's aside from some fleshed out combat encounters it's worse in every way but i am certainly glad that they left the overworld portions alone at the very least so you you'll still have fun playing master quest ocarina but not really in the dungeons i guess i was just surprised that the zelda team had put together such a annoying and vindictive experience that kind of just jerks you around more than anything but that's uh, i guess what they went with it's not their best work by any means and with that that will conclude the thing about things segment of the show and following a short music break i will move on into my wii game review for this episode so stay tuned for that game I'm going to be reviewing this episode is Mario Kart Wii. I don't really know where to begin when talking about this game. It's a Mario Kart game. You hold down a button for the gas and you steer with the stick and you drift with the shoulder button and you throw items such as red shells, green shells, or more complicated items at opposing racers. In the game features race tracks, old and new, that are reminiscent of the Mushroom Kingdom, or areas that are tangential to the Mushroom Kingdom, such as DK Jungle. Yeah, it's it's a Mario Kart game, and it also happens to be the best-selling Mario Kart game of all time, selling over 30 million units while it was on store shelves. And I think it might still be on store shelves somewhere. But anyway, Mario Kart Wii does feature some new additions that make it unique from other Mario Kart games. For one thing, it was packed in with a peripheral known as the Wii Wheel, and the Wii Wheel was packed in because Mario Kart Wii, like Excite Truck, had a control scheme where you flipped the Wii remote on its side and steered with motions like that of moving a steering wheel. And of course, the Wii remote fit snugly into this Wii Wheel to make that more immersive and ergonomic. This isn't the only way you can play Mario Kart Wii. If you have a GameCube controller on hand or a classic controller, you can use the traditional stick layout. And I think even the nunchuck attached to the Wii remote would also bring about the same result. I didn't do that myself, but I believe that's the case. The other major addition Mario Kart Wii brought to the franchise is two-wheeled vehicles, motorcycles, and the like, perhaps mopeds too. And while they lack the stability of the traditional cart, they make up for that with speed. Otherwise, I think that's really all they added that it's major. 
in Mario Kart Wii, motorcycles, and the motion control steering. They also added the trick system, which I almost forgot about. And while it's subtle in its addition, it's kind of important and is featured in every Mario Kart since. And the game introduces lots of jumps and sort of quarter pipe rails to encourage the trick system. So overall, that's really the game in a nutshell. It's a typical Mario Kart that has 32 courses, 16 new, 16 old, has a bunch of racers, some of them unique to this game, such as Funky Kong, and it has a 50cc, has 100cc, and 150cc in mirror mode, and all those other things. As as for my actual feelings of the game, to start with the positives, I think the racetracks, the new racetracks in particular, are pretty solid. They're better than double dashes in moment-to-moment -moment ways, though overall I think the double dash package is better. But I think we has more pronounced portions in its racetracks than Double Dash does. I don't know how to explain it better than that, but, you know, there's more crowd-pleasing moments in certain racetracks. I do think that whether it was DS or Wii, the Mario Kart racetracks start to resemble that sort of theme park kind of race where it's just a visual stimulation more than a race with uh, eye-popping visuals and with sections of the track that are more visually stimulating and uh, perhaps viscerally stimulating as well. And they also add unique assets to each track in a way that I don't feel Double Dash did quite as extensively. Or same with Mario Kart 64, where those games, they just kind of feel like racing games. And there are unique assets in those tracks, but they're not as um, specific. For an example, Toad's Factory is full of all these sort of factory-esque assets. Conveyor belts that have boxes that are moving, and you have to weave between that. They have these special strips of track that will either speed you up or slow you down that you have to manage and there's big stompy assembly line machinery you know things like that that uh, make the factory element more pronounced or mushroom gorge has these bouncy mushrooms and there are two different kinds one that give you a decent size bounce and then the red ones which give you a huge bounce things like that every track has a unique asset to it crumble volcano has the crumbling race track that gets tighter and tighter as more pieces of land fall away so comparing mario kart wii's tracks to mario kart double dash and mario kart 64 the tracks are a lot more developed within their unique ideas and uh, they've dug in a little more on those and uh, I it's largely successful I do think that this game has tracks in it that feel kind of generic to just the mushroom world and they're not really specific to anything Unlike, say, Mario Kart Double Dash, that felt like an extension of Mario Sunshine, probably because they were using assets because they were running out of time. But whatever the case, that adds an element of cohesion between the two games that I kind of latched on to. With this sort of track design, everything is kind of just... Uh, Un unspecific i can't think of the word there's a better word but yeah gen generic mushroom kingdom 
asset hodgepodge of things more than anything truly pointed in its uh, visual representation. Again, it's I think the tracks are very solid in this game. I don't necessarily like the second cup that has DK Mountain or DK Summit and Wario's Gold Mine or Mario Circuit. Coconut Mall is pretty good in that. Cup, the Flower Cup, that circuit's not terribly great, but the first, third, and fourth are reasonably good. I think Star Cup is the best, the third one. I think for the retro tracks, I'm not sure it's as solid. I find the tracks they chose are kind of... Uh, I don't know. I know DS has a bunch of really excellent courses in it, and it seems like the courses they picked for this game and they picked four, they're the boring ones. I think the only DS track of those four I like is Delfino Square, and that's honestly just because it's kind of a nice fleshed out looking town with a bunch of fun shortcuts. It's a visually pleasing track, and I guess it feels kind of grounded in a way that a lot of the other tracks don't. But otherwise, they, all the DS tracks aren't very good. I find that two of the four GameCube tracks they picked are also boring. Mario, They picked Mario Circuit, which in Double Dash is kind of interesting because it's really, really hard for some unknown reason, but it's otherwise visually boring. And uh, Peach Beach is a nice looking level in Mario Kart Double Dash, but in Mario Kart Wii's visual style, I don't think it lands nearly as well. I suppose Waluigi Stadium and DK Mountain from the GameCube game are pretty good picks, but those other two are kind of eh, kind of boring, kind of lousy. Other, otherwise, like you also then have a mixture of a couple SNES courses and then a couple GBA courses in your retro tracks as well as N64. Yeah, th they're fine. Like I think overall the retro track selection is not as good as it usually is. I think 7 has a better roster of those tracks and I think uh, 8 has a better roster and yeah I mean it's, it's new tracks at the very least are pretty solid and I enjoy seeing them in other Mario Kart titles the racing itself it kind of reminds me of Mario Kart 7 and a little bit of 8 but it's more sluggish than Mario Kart 7 which isn't necessarily a bad thing but compared to say Double Dash which is, in my opinion, squirrely as you can get. Like, if I was to get into how the games feel, I think that Mario Kart 64 is probably the most pleasant playing racing game of all of them, which is odd because, you know, it's, it's such a rudimentary game you'd figure, but its racing feels really good. And then Double Dash... Its racing feels incredibly chaotic and messy, but there's a design in that. And then Wii feels it, it's much more sluggish and more based on drifting at the right time. And 7 and 8 certainly take after Mario Kart Wii's steering sensibilities, but I think they're a little more forgiving and maybe they feel a little better. The the interesting thing about Mario Kart Wii's steering is that it almost feels at its best when you're using the Wii wheel with the motion controls because your ability to weave between bananas on the track with subtle little rotations of that wheel actually feel really good. And coming off of Double Dash, that was kind of a pleasant change of pace because in Double Dash, like if you veered away from Banana, you might fall right off the track. It's that squirrely, and that's 
the way it is. But in we, as I said, you can kind of gingerly go between them, especially on the bike, because your profile is so much smaller. And the the controls, of course, with the GameCube controller or the classic controller feel ginger and um, smooth like that too. But if you want to take sharp turns, you really have to anticipate them because you're, it just kind of feels like your nose doesn't align with that turn as fast as you want to. Like you're, you just don't cut turns like you do in Double Dash or even Mario 64. And again, I don't know if that's a bad thing. That might be a promising thing. I only played the game for 20 hours, so I don't know if I ever got fully adjusted to its control setup. There are a number of things I do like about the controls, in addition to sort of their kind of ginger, smooth turning, at least in, when it comes to small turns. I like the fact that you can hold an item behind you like you could in Mario Kart 64. I understand that the whole double item thing and double dash is a real selling point for that game, but personally I would have just liked to be able to hold an item behind me rather than have to time throwing a banana down. And you can do that in Mario Kart Wii, but only if you are using traditional controls. You can't do it if you're using the Wii wheel. And that's kind of a weird limitation. I like the trick system. It does it does make the game feel pretty good to play. Gives an extra little kick. A little sprinkle of flavor. And I do like the way the motorcycles feel. They have their own set of advantages and disadvantages. For one thing, they're considerably more maneuverable than the carts. And they're generally faster, especially if you pop a wheelie on a straightaway. I think in this game, if you were doing time trials, you would always use the motorcycle because you're going to get the best time due to that ability to pop wheelies. And if you're, again, if you're on a straightaway, you'll hold that position for a while. If you tilt the Wii wheel up or you hit up on the D-pad and you'll just kind of maintain that for maybe five seconds and you lose the ability to steer largely. So you'll have to hit the drift button to get out of it if you're too close to an edge and you might not do it in time. Or, this is the big one, is your stability on the motorcycle is generally worse overall, but if you're in a wheelie pose, it's outright terrible and you'll get knocked out of it and be slowed right down. So you have to be strategic with your wheelies. And in addition to the lack of stability that the motorcycles have the turning on them is a little different in that they have more maneuverability than the carts and sort of quick little movement side to side but if you're taking a sharp turn and i'm not a motorhead so i can't really describe it perfectly but their turns are more rounded you can't cut a turn so sharply as you can with a cart. So some of those later levels, such as Maple Treeway, that one turn near the beginning before you get shot out of the cannon, I don't know if I could even make that turn with a motorcycle if I wasn't really anticipating it. I can barely do it with a cart. Yeah, overall, the motorcycles are a fine addition there. Maybe the best thing about the game, mechanically speaking. And I don't really know if I have anything else to say about the game that's good. I would say that playing the battle mode for three hours by myself with bots, that was actually kind of fun. I don't really like battle mode in Mario Kart, but I gave this one a go. And the team battle aspect is kind of neat and I like the track gimmicks 
such as a giant chain chomp head that rolls around and crushes you on a some kind of casino wheel. That's a fun stage or funkies, whatever land. That was an interesting one as well. But the fact that there's no elimination in that mode is a little lame. I think the fact that if you lose all your blooms and other Mario Kart games leading you to game over creates more tension and is therefore more interesting than the way they have it set up for this game. Even so, I think the battle mode isn't half bad. I had more fun with it than I had with other Mario Kart games, at the very least. So those are the good things about the game. Everything else I'm going to say from here on out is more or less negative or mixed. If I was to be brief on what's wrong with this game, I I don't I think the game takes everything good about it and then kind of cancels it out with something bad. And most of that is a matter of balancing the the item game in Mario Kart Wii is utterly atrocious. I've heard it mentioned before, but I just thought people were being petty. Like, the way people are petty about the final boss in No More Heroes 2. Yeah, he's kind of annoying, but, you know, it's no more annoying than every other boss in the first game. So, I thought people were just being that. But, uh, the blue shell, and for, for instance, in this game, is a monster. It's terrible. And the lightning's awful, and the pow block is terrible, too. I know there's a way to beat that somehow. That doesn't require you to be in the air, but I don't know. All three of those are awful, and they're overbearing. And and all the other items are terrible, too. And the frequency in which these items occur is just atrocious. And the racer grouping in this game is also kind of awful as well and it just feels like a chaotic mess in a way that is similar to Mario Kart Double Dash which is the one I played most recently and that and by in theory that would mean that Mario Karts are just this way and while a game like Double Dash is as chaotic there's a rhyme and reason to Double Dash's chaos. It's built from the ground up to be the way it is, and that gives it a special kind of dynamic and feeling to it. And if you get good at the game, you can overcome the chaos, and that's kind of the the long game within Double Dash. But this game, it's a generally smooth experience. As I said, the controls feel kind of nice, and the tracks are kind of wide often and the gimmicks of each track are kind of visual and uh, gimmicky i mean they're just sort of feel good additions but then you add in the blue shell that happens four times per race the lightning that happens like five the pow block that happens just as many times and whatever 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 and then it just becomes a a mess and it's a top-down kind of mess, not ground-up like Double Dash. just feels like they added three things to make everything feel terrible. And it's not even a thing of if it feels good or bad, because that's not how I judge things. There's usually more to it than that. There's a rhyme and a reason, but whatever rhyme and reason that this game has... At its best, it's a attempt to make sure that a five-year-old would beat a 20-year-old in a race. And that might be it, because winning races in this game is entirely random. And that's apparently what people say about Mario Kart in general, but with Double Dash, that wasn't the case. With 64, while there was certainly rubber banding with the AI... But that just added some tension to the game. You could still win consistently, even if it was unfair. And all the other Mario Kart games, while they do have a nonsense factor in them, 
you can still consistently win semi consistently at the very least this game mario kart wii i don't know how you win at all i have gone from first to 12th i've gone from 12th to first and it's all a matter of what item i got for the most part and that's just not interesting or enjoyable makes victories and losses feel cheap equally there's nothing to it i'll get a try better next time on a course and how i raced was no better than or was no worse excuse me than when i got a gold on that track and that in my opinion and frankly i would almost say objectively makes the act of getting better at this game completely worthless I know there are people who have developed techniques that can ensure that they win more frequently, and that's interesting and promising, but I never got that far, and I don't think it would ever fully mitigate the nonsense of it. To explain how a race will go in this game, you will start the race, and somebody gets a bullet bill from the first box, and then... You'll get hit by lightning probably before the first lap is even up. And that will happen four more times. And at all times during the race, the drivers will be about a second apart from each other. That will never change whether you're in first or in twelfth. There have been times where I've won with maybe two seconds ahead of the guy in second place. So it is possible to get ahead, but it's, it's unlikely especially when you make a tiny, tiny mistake, like getting hit by a green shell or a red shell. You'll go from first to seventh in no time. If you touch the edge of grass, you'll slow right down, and your cart will feel like it's in mud. You can't do anything, so you can't even get off the grass once you touch it. And you'll go from first to tenth. You'll get hit by a blue shell. You'll go from first to eighth. You'll get three mushrooms, and you'll go from eighth to to first there is no journey in winning the race it's just a lottery and i think it sucks i think it's terrible shows a complete lack of design or maybe it's purely intentional that this game after all did sell 30 million units and maybe that kind of lottery notion appeals to a more casual family crowd where you don't just want the older sibling winning all the time but uh, as a game, outside of that, I think it's outright terrible. Like, it just does not have any skill curve to it at all, and there's just no point playing it. It doesn't feel good. I hate this. I could probably go on about a couple more things I don't like pertaining to this element, but I think I've said enough on it. The second thing I really don't enjoy about this game is its art style. This game was released in April 2008. So that's about six months into the second year of the Wii, and the game looks terrible. Looks worse than Mario Kart Double Dash. And this is coming off of Super Mario Galaxy, which came out maybe six months before November 2007, something like that, and that game showed the potential of the Wii's graphical ability. And it's very well known now that the Wii was well behind the Xbox and the PS3, but there was some muddy water when it came to how weak it was, and so Super Mario Galaxy made people believe that, you know, the Wii was more powerful than the GameCube by a considerable margin, and games like The Conduit were being talked about at that time that had really good bump map textures and things like that. So all, all to say that the Wii was fulfilling its potential graphically. And Mario Kart Wii, which is, you know, well into that, life cycle when that's already started to happen just looks awful 
And that's mostly because of the extra lighting, complex lighting. I don't know what you call that, but I think it's bloom lighting introduced into the game where they introduced this complex lighting system, more complex than what's come before, but then they didn't make any of the models look good. Like the models, I think hypothetically, they look as good as Double Dash's perhaps, but Double Dash kind of had a Wind Waker thing going where things would just kind of become smudgy in the distance. And so... It kind of gave the world a flat, cartoony look, and the color saturation on the characters looked really good. Basically, that blurring together effect that they talk about in Skyward Sword was happening. The game world in Double Dash looks really good due to its kind of flat, limited lighting. But then you take it, special lighting and you shine up everything you really see how crude and ugly those character models are and the game's lighting engine i don't even know if it looks that good anyway the racetracks look washed out the character models look flat and boring and plasticky because there's no real color on them and i i think the game just looks kind of terrible they do attempt some interesting things with reflective surfaces like in sherbert land where uh, the ice reflects the player and their cart and that's kind of neat but it's a momentary pleasure when the entire game kind of looks like junk and that's a really fine example of making something better which then results in it being made worse like with some of the remasters that they do for Wind Waker HD or even SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom, they add all this complex lighting and stuff, and those games just lose something. Particularly Wind Waker HD, which I was not a believer that it looked any worse on any real level, but playing the original, it's it's pretty night and day where you just look at things and you're like, oh, that's not a cartoony ship it's a big ugly 3d model things things like that where that just as an example it doesn't actually serve the game well at all in short if they wanted to make a better lighting engine they should have made better character models too because the game looks terrible even the retro tracks like the ones from gamecube just in that art style they don't look as good they look kind of flat and there's just something wrong with them they don't have the same pizzazz that they did in their original game. I will say that Moonview Highway, which is a nighttime track, does look really good at the very least. It has some kind of atmosphere, and the Rainbow Road in this game, while also being kind of washed out and ugly, isn't terrible looking. So there's examples of the game looking halfway decent, but the overall package blah looks terrible another complaint i have with the game is that the motion controls don't actually work as well as i'd like them to really it's a matter of going out of alignment that's the huge issue because the how do i put it as you race you might fail to return your motion controls to your default position a perfectly horizontal Wii remote and as you race it your alignment becomes weirder and weirder and sometimes even if you try to accurately return to your default position coming out of a turn the gyroscope won't read it correctly and therefore you'll actually just sort of stay in a position where you didn't want to go, such as beelining into a wall or off a ledge, and that just doesn't feel really good at all. Or I think it's actually when eventually the, probably due to continued misalignment or something, the gyroscope won't read a turn at all, and that's why you'll go into a wall, as well as the aspect that you just can't return to your default position as consistent as a stick does where it just sort of snaps back to center yeah it's not great and i think it's solvable because 
Excite truck, which uses the exact same control style, has no issue doing this. And that's probably due to the fact that they made the controls more squarely, so there was no need for an exaggerated motion on your part. Or it's because of some kind of programming, some kind of correctional programming that I have no idea about. But more than likely, it's the range of motion that they want you to use that's the real issue. And I figure this because in a smoother level where the turns aren't so sharp, you won't have this issue nearly at all, such as any of the levels in the first cup, like Moo Moo Meadows, for instance. There's no real danger of this misalignment or failure to return to the default position happening in that level. But then, say, in Ghost Valley, where the turns become really sharp, you just run into those walls and off the ledge so often in that one, it's just kind of terrible. It doesn't work at all. So I figure it's literally just a matter of poor development in terms of the Wii motion controls. Because in Excite Truck, it totally works without a hitch. I had no problems with Excite Truck's controls. But this one, uh, it seemed like your propensity to go into a wall or off a ledge was about once a race or once every two races. Twice a race if the race was a little more difficult. And if you get bipped by a player, which is on the regular control setting, annoying. In this case, it's even worse because you'll turn sharp to autocorrect getting knocked off course and it just won't work. You'll misread it because you did it too fast and in too jerky of a motion or you just don't have time to do it at all and it sucks. It's the, the motion controls are weirdly inconsistent and that isn't because of the motion controls. That's because of uh, it's because of the development behind the game. They uh, clearly weren't aware of the limitations of that hardware at the time. Doesn't doesn't feel great. And with that, I think that's everything I really wanted to say about Mario Kart Wii. So I'll move on right into a number score here shortly after a short summary of my feelings. Mario Kart Wii, at its best, is a reasonably good middle-of-the-road Mario Kart with pretty good course design, and you'll probably never get to experience that because the dog pile of misfortune that happens throughout the game, and there's nothing you can do about it because it's all random and based purely on what items you get, not your skill in racing. And uh, the game also looks really bad, too. So It's a mess of a game that doesn't look very good and is shallow to play, as well as infuriating. So, with all that in mind, I'm going to give Mario Kart Wii a 5.5 out of 10. It's a little better than middle of the road because of its fun race tracks and the motorcycles fun to use and it's functional to play it's just that the carrot on the stick isn't enticing at all so 5.5 out of 10 you're a little more likely to have some fun with it than you are not to have any at all so that's that's what it gets as for where it ranks Normally I start from the top, but with a score that's on the lower side, I'm going to start from the bottom. And the question is, is it better than Battalion Wars 2? And the answer is no. Not really at all. I think Battalion Wars 2, while kind of a shallow game that doesn't really live up to the potential that its predecessor had, it's still fun functional and a interesting somewhat one-of-a-kind experience that you can't really get anywhere else outside of that franchise as for mario kart wii there are a myriad of better mario karts to play i'm 
pretty sure this might be the worst Mario Kart. I haven't played DS yet, but I only hear good things about that game. And Super Circuit, I've heard, is hard to play, but I imagine it's kind of rewarding getting those weird Super Nintendo Mario Kart controls down. There's a payoff to it. And also, getting back to comparing these two, Battalion Wars 2 has a better art style and... Its motion controls also can be wonky, but they are, for the most part, functional in all of its vehicles, with an exception here and there, such as with the jet fighters. But Mario Kart Wii, while you can certainly play it traditionally and mitigate the motion control fiddliness, the motion controls that they suggest that you use just don't work enough to justify using them at all even though they kind of feel nice to use in the more easier racetracks so mario kart we goes beneath battalion wars 2 and that will do it for my review of mario kart Wii. so the rankings as they are are mario strikers charged at number one punch out at number two rabbits go home at number three Sin and Punishment 2 at number 4, No More Heroes at number 5, Red Steel 2 at number 6, No More Heroes 2 Desperate Struggle at number 7, Wario Land Shake It at number 8, Metroid Other M at number 9, Goldeneye 007 at number 10, Excite Truck at number 11, Battalion Wars 2 at number 12, and Mario Kart Wii at number 13. Now with that, the show is over. If you have any questions or comments or complaints, you can send them to the email address nalistenerq at gmail.com. That is nalistenerq at gmail.com. But until my next show... Blessings on all of you, and have a good week.